Our next speaker is one of the organizers of this program, and that is Stanley Beck. And he will be speaking on the always important subject of minority shareholders' rights. Stan Beck was educated at the University of British Columbia and at Yale University getting his LLM. He then uh, received the Mackenzie King Traveling Scholarship in 1958, whatever that is. He was a visiting fellow at Oxford in 1975. He has taught law at uh, the University of British Columbia from 1959 to 1963. He practiced law in Vancouver, 1961 to 62. He taught law at Queen's University from 64 to 67. He taught law at Osgoode Hall Law School, 66 to 77. And as you all know, in 1977, uh, he became dean of the law school at Osgoode Hall. This man cannot hold a job. <laughs> now, he has been a research associate with the Select Committee in Company Law, Ontario. He has. Uh, been on the Federal Task Force on the Canada Corporations Act, and uh, he's probably most famous now for being a commissioner of the Ontario Securities Commission, which he has been for the past 11 years. He has learned publications in uh, uh, editions such as the CBR run to 21. You're, you're going to talk about them yourself. He also, <laughs> apparently, he also, among his other uh, accomplishments, uh, considers himself, at least, to be an expert on wine and on tennis. This view is not universally held in the legal community. I'll give you a Dean Beck. Thank you, Bert. I think I'll uh, charge Tim Kennish with, un with uh, unfair competition. He took 20 minutes of my time. And uh, he had a monopoly on the only mic in the, uh, in the place. However, I have uh, a, a lot to run through, so uh, uh, bear with me. In considering the rights and remedies of minority shareholders in the 1980s, it's useful to refer as a starting framework to a leading company law decision of the Privy Council in the 1880s, Northwest Transportation Company uh, against Beattie. I'm sure you'll recall that in that case, Mr. Beattie, a, minor a majority shareholder and director, wished to sell his own property to the company and sought the sanction of the shareholders. The transaction was approved, but only through Mr. Beattie's uh, own votes. A minority shareholder complained, and the Ontario Chancellor, we had chancellors in those days, treated the question as one of purely equitable law and held that Mr. Beattie's threefold character of director, shareholder, and vendor involved a conflict between duty and interest such that he ought not to be allowed to exercise his voting power. In a strong judgment, the Supreme Court of Canada affirmed. The Privy Council reversed and drew a strict line between Beattie's role as a director and his rights as a shareholder, regardless of the extent of his shareholdings. To quote the Privy Council, Mr. Beattie had a perfect right to acquire further shares and to exercise his voting power in such a manner as to secure the election of directors whose views upon policy agreed with his own, and to support those views at any shareholder's meeting. To reject the votes of the defendant would be to give effect to the views of the minority and to disregard those of the majority. In short, a share is personal property, and the, may, and the owner may exercise his voting rights attached to that property as he thinks fit in his own best interests, even if those interests are opposed to those of the company. Now, when it is appreciated that the general meeting has control of almost the entire range of fundamental corporate transactions, such as alteration of share capital, any alteration in the articles or bylaws, amalgamations or arrangements, sanctioning of contracts in which directors are interested, and of course, election of directors, it will be appreciated how important and how broad was the holding of the Privy Council in Northwest Transportation. Moreover, the decision in Northwest Transportation must also be seen in the light of the turn of the century case of Percival and Wright, which held that the director's fiduciary duties run only to the company and not to the shareholders. To be sure, the courts worked out some exceptions to uh, that proposition, and the limitation uh, on the majority 
was construed under the title fraud on the minority. However, the fraud on the minority exception was very narrowly construed and almost invariably involved a taking of corporate property to the exclusion of the minority or a taking of the minority's shares or an imposition of a restriction on their rights as shareholders, but then only in very limited circumstances. It's not too much to say that the major thrust of corporate law reform in Canada over the past decade, and it has been a decade of almost fervent change in corporate and securities law, has been to overcome the substantive and procedural roadblocks placed in the way of minority shareholders by Northwest Transportation and Beattie, <coughs> Percival and Wright, and Foss v. Harbottle. The procedural th thicket that grew up from the seed of majority rule planted in Foss and Harbottle has been largely cleared away by the statutory shareholders' derivative action. The substantive aspects of majority rule and the lack of a fiduciary duty owed by the directors to the shareholders or, or, or a fortiori by the majority shareholders to the minority has been dealt with in an ad hoc fashion over the past 10 years by the legislatures, by the courts, and by such public and quasi-public agencies as the Ontario Securities Commission and the Toronto Stock Exchange. The position of the minority shareholder has been dramatically enhanced over the past decade, and the next decade will see minority shareholders' rights being more fully worked out and a balance struck between the rights of the majority and the minority and the need to operate the company in terms of its long-term commercial interests as those interests are seen by directors and majority shareholders. What follows will be an attempt to outline some of the major changes that have taken place and to indicate some directions for the future. I'd like to begin with the oppression remedy. The oppression remedy, as it appears in Section 234 of the CBCA and in Section 246 of Bill 6, an act to revise the Ontario Business Corporations Act, which I will refer to as the New Ontario Act or the Ontario Act, is beyond question the broadest, most comprehensive, and most open-ended shareholder remedy in the common law world. It is quite unprecedented in its scope. It is now being applied to a wide variety of situations in both public and private companies, and most importantly, the courts have shown a willingness to carry out its remedial mandate. The potential for remedy is so broad that I would confidently predict that over the next decade, it will, re it will result in a fundamental change in the nature of minority shareholders' rights. To appreciate how far we have come in 10 years in Ontario, it is worth noting that the Select Committee on Company Law, the Lawrence Committee, upon, which, upon whose report the uh, uh, current OBCA is based, rejected the uh, UK oppression remedy on the basis that it raises as many problems as it lays to rest, and more importantly, is objectionable on the ground that it is a complete dereliction of the established principles of judicial non-interference in the management of companies. It abandons the problem of problems of minority shareholders to the judiciary to be dealt with ad hoc from case to case. Well, what, one wonders what the authors of the Lawrence Report would have thought of uh, Section 246 of the New Ontario Act. A number of the features of Section 246 need to be emphasized to appreciate the extent of the remedy and the breadth of the discretion given to the trial judge. First, the complainant who is given standing includes not only current shareholders, but all former shareholders, all current and former directors and officers, as well as any other person who in the discretion of the court is a proper person to make an application. For the court to fashion a remedy, it must be satisfied that any act or omission of the corporation, the business or affairs of the corporation, or the powers of the directors of the corporation have been carried on in a manner that is either oppressive unfairly prejudicial to or unfairly disregards the interests of any security holder, creditor, director, or officer of the corporation. Even broader than the above <coughs> are the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's necessary to emphasize the breadth <clears throat> by which the conduct of the corporation and its directors are to be judged. It is not simply oppression, but conduct that is oppressive or unfairly prejudicial to or unfairly or that unfairly disregards the interests of. And presumably, the legislature intended three different meanings to be given to three separate tests. 
Clearly, the traditional categories of fraud on the minority have been jettisoned and replaced by as yet unmarked equitable tests of unfairly prejudicial or unfairly disregards. As to the remedial powers of the court, Section 246 sub 3, which tracks Section 234 sub 3 of the CBCA, empowers the court to make any interim or final order it thinks fit, including a list of 14 specific remedies. One would be hard put to think of a remedy that has not been included in the list, particularly when one notes that they include amendment of a company's articles or bylaws, the issuance or exchange of securities, an order to purchase securities of a shareholder, an order varying or setting aside a transaction or a contract, a compensation order, or an order winding up the corporation. I'd like to now turn to uh, some of the oppression cases to indicate to you uh, just how broad the remedy is. Uh, two cases, both in British Columbia, and the majority of the oppression cases are from British Columbia, as that was the first Canadian jurisdiction in 1973 to uh, enact uh, a, a provision similar to uh, 246. The two cases are Diligenti against RWMD Operations and West Fraser Timber Company uh, v. Johnson. Diligenti uh, was the not unusual circumstance of a falling out between shareholders of a private company and the operation of the company's business. As a result of the disagreement, the plaintiff was ousted to, as a director. He had no more say uh, in the management. Director's fees were increased to uh, $1,000 per month, and a management fee payable to the respondent's company was increased to 2.5% of gross sales. Mr. Justice Fulton held that in a private company where participation in management is of the essence of the interest and concern of the shareholders, removal of a director does affect the member in that capacity, and the conduct here was unfairly prejudicial to the applicant. Under Section 246 and under the CBCA, uh, it, it need not be oppression in the capacity just as a, of, uh, of a member. It can be a director, officer, or creditor. In so holding, Mr. Justice Fulton ruled that in adding the words unfairly prejudicial to the statute, the legislature must have intended that the courts would give those words an effect different from and going beyond that given to the word oppressive. And under the uh, Ontario Act and Canada Act, the addition of the words unfairly disregards the interests of must contemplate conduct different from and going beyond conduct encompassed in the phrase unfairly prejudicial. The recent judgment in West Fraser Timber seems to me to go beyond that in Diligenti in terms of the conduct complained of. Although West Fraser is again a private company case, it is not a case where the applicant appears as a major investor and a participating partner in the classic incorporated partnership. The applicant worked his way up in the company and became ultimately uh, the president and chief executive officer, but by no means a major shareholder. As a result of internal disagreement, the applicant demanded and received both written and oral undertakings from the majority shareholder, as a result of which he agreed to stay on as president. One of the undertakings was that the controlling shareholders would give up some of their control and take the company public, thus creating a market for the applicant's shares. Following Diligenti, Mr. Justice Wallace held that the applicant's equitable rights were unfairly prejudice prejudiced by the respondent's failure to live up to the undertakings. In so holding, Mr. Justice Wallace quoted from an unreported decision in BC, O'Neill v. Dunsmuir Holdings, where the court held that the question, the wider question was whether the majority have dealt honestly and fairly with the minority. Mr. Justice Wallace held that the benefits which the applicant had bargained for were first, an enhanced position of power and influence in the management of the company, and second, an increased market for his shares. It is important to note that there was no economic damage to the corporation, nor any advantage being taken by the respondents that was not given to the applicants, as was clearly the case in Diligenti, nor is there any finding of bad faith on the part of the respondents. Indeed, there was part performance of the undertakings. And moreover, I, I think it's important to note, there may well have been sound economic reasons for not taking West, Favor West Fraser Timber public at that time. These matters were not adverted to by the trial judge. 
He concludes that the respondents did not live up to their agreement and that the appropriate remedy was for Johnson's shares to be purchased at fair value that would have pertained if the undertakings had been complied with, that is, if a public market had been created for his shares. West Fraser seems to me to indicate how far we have come and how willing the courts are to protect the rights of majority shareholders under the oppression remedy. I would stress again that West Fraser does not involve any of the usual factors of a shareholder being removed from corporate office or being denied his share of corporate profits or of one group of shareholders being given an advantage that is not being made available to another or any showing of conflict of interest on the part of the majority or any showing of economic damage to the corporation or any showing of bad faith on the part of the respondents. It was simply and solely a case of failing to live up to an undertaking made to the company president in terms of the scope of exercise of that office and in terms of creating a viable public market for his shares. The next example, and one that you might think uh, goes too far, uh, in, in restraining action taken in what was clearly the best economic interests of the corporation, is illustrated uh, in the Quebec decision in Re Sabex International. Sabex was formed by the coming together of two businesses. Each of the uh, shareholders originally had an equal interest. The company went through a difficult time, and, uh, and as a result of a management restructuring, the respondent held 54% of the shares and the applicant held 44%. The company was in the drug business. It wished to market a new drug and decided to move its manufacturing headquarters from Quebec City to Montreal, all of which required an injection of new capital. Uh, the company's bankers uh, were agreeable. They increased the line of credit to $600,000, conditional on the raising of $100,000 of additional equity capital. Accordingly, the respondents proposed a pro rata rights offering of uh, 3 million shares at 5 cents per share. The offering was cleared by the Quebec Securities Commission on the basis that all shareholders were being treated equally. The applicants complained under Section 234 of the CBCA on the basis that the rights offering was oppressive in that it obliged them to subscribe to avoid dilution of their interest. The respondents understandably replied that if the applicant shareholdings were to be diluted, it would be as a result of their own decision not to take up their subscription rights. The respondents readily agreed that the company had a very bright prospects and that unless the applicants subscribed, they would not enjoy so great a degree of participation as they had previously. The court granted a restraining injunction, noting that the Quebec Securities Commission did not consider the rights of the parties inter se in approving the rights issue. It is important to note that the court did not question, as it could not on the facts, the fact that the company required an injection of, of equity capital for well-justified expansion. Nor was there any question that the shareholders were not being treated equally. Nor was there any question of lack of bona fides or discrimination. The court seemed simply to say that the method of financing chosen would cause a dilution of the minority interest if the minority chose not to subscribe. The effect, therefore, would be to force them to subscribe, and this would be oppressive conduct on the part of the respondent. It seems to me that uh, we have come from the, from the position where we, where we did not have in our jurisprudence, as uh, there was in the American jurisprudence, the doctrine of the majority owing a fiduciary duty to the minority, to the position where we have leap, leapfrogged that legal development, to a position under the oppression remedy where the majority must now ask itself, how will this action affect the interests of the minority? Not just the rights, but the interests of the minority. An interesting question, and one that's still to be decided by the courts, is whether and to what extent the oppression remedy has swallowed up the shareholder's derivative action. The importance of that question is illustrated by the fact that under the shareholder's derivative action sections, it's necessary for a shareholder to get the leave of the court. The action is under the control of the court. Any settlement must be sanctioned by the court and uh, any award runs directly to the corporation and not to the shareholder. None of those facts uh, pertain in the oppression remedy. That is, uh, the shareholder uh, uh, brings his own action, uh, a settlement is uh, possible, and any award goes directly to the shareholder. Therefore, there are uh, significant procedural advantages to moving under the oppression remedy rather than under the derivative action sections. What the courts will have to work out 
is uh, the, uh, the way the two sections will meld. There is a British Columbia case, Redekop v. Robco Construction, which was uh, a, clearly a case of uh, breach of fiduciary duty by the director to the company. Uh, an oppression remedy uh, was brought, a relief was granted, and the court ordered that the minority shareholder shares be purchased. Now that is not a remedy that is available under the derivative action section and uh, as you can imagine is an extremely important uh, uh, remedy. Well I think that's enough for the oppression remedy. I think you can see that uh, <clears throat> we ha now have it in the CBCA, we will have it in the new Ontario Act and it is one of the most significant changes in company law uh, uh, that I am, of, of which I am aware. <clears throat> I'd now like to turn to the amalgamation cases. <clears throat> the changing attitude of the courts to the position of the minority shareholder is most strikingly illustrated in the spate of amalgamation, arrangement, and appraisal cases that have been decided in recent years. The colorful and often pejorative language that is used to characterize the nature of the transactions as freeze-outs, squeeze-outs, cash-outs, and squeeze-ins gives the clue as to why the courts have shown a new militancy on behalf of the minority shareholder. What is happening in these cases is expropriation, and whether or not for fair value, courts have never looked kindly on a compulsory taking of private property. The interference with property rights is seen to be the more gross because the only justification by the acquirer for its action is its own future economic advantage, a future in which the minority is not to be allowed to share. The two leading and oft commented upon cases, Carlton Realty Limited v. Maple Leaf Mills and Alexander v. West Steel Roscoe, both involved amalgamation squeeze-outs. In Maple Leaf, <clears throat> Norin Canada, as a result of a takeover bid and a transfer of shares to it by its uh, majority American, uh, by its uh, American parent, uh, became the owner of 94.5% of the outstanding Maple Leaf shares. Maple Leaf was an Ontario company and there is no provision in the OBCA now equivalent to section 199.2 of the CBCA which allows for compulsory acquisition of the remaining shares if there is 90% acceptance of a bid. The new Ontario Act does contain such a compulsory acquisition provision in section 186.1. The usual amalgamation squeeze out was proposed whereby Maple Leaf would, would amalgamate with Norin and one of its wholly owned subsidiaries. Maple Leaf shareholders would receive redeemable preference shares with the stated intention being to redeem immediately after the amalgamation, the redemption price $18 being the same price as the takeover bid price. The plaintiff sought, among other things, an interim junction to prevent the meeting taking place to approve the amalgamation. It's also interesting to note that the plaintiff argued in the alternative that the minority be treated as a separate class as if the matter were an arrangement under section 185 sub 4 and thus be permitted a separate vote on the matter. Mr. Justice Steele noted that there was no Ontario case on the point. He, re he was referred to two arrangement cases which allowed for a squeeze out, but noted that the OBCA requires court approval of an arrangement. The amalgamation required no such court approval. <clears throat> it was in what I regard as a very important passage for possible future cases in this area, Mr. Justice Steele made the following comment. A person is entitled to retain his property if he so wishes, except where there is a right held by another to forcibly take it. It matters not for what economic advantage the amalgamation is sought. I see no clear right under the Act to permit the taking of the applicant's common shares by the means proposed. Accordingly, an injunction was granted. One week after Maple Leaf Mills was heard, West Deal Roscoe was argued. Now, West Deal Roscoe was a CBCA company, not an OBCA company. The majority shareholder of West Deal was unsuccessful in a takeover bid in acquiring the 90% necessary to entitle to acquire the shares under the compulsory acquisition section. A squeeze out amalgamation was structured along the lines of Maple Leaf Mills. Mr. Justice Montgomery's ruling in, in uh, or Mr. Justice Steele's ruling in uh, Maple Leaf was referred to. Mr. Justice Montgomery acceded to the argument that Section 119 of the CBCA provided a route for compulsory acquisition of shares and that the amalgamation proposed provided the only manner of doing an end run around Section 199. And he was of the opinion that the amalgamation was an attempt to do indirectly what was not permitted directly. <clears throat> 
I would also note that uh, uh, the West Steel Roscoe was brought under the oppression section of the CBCA, which is a, a distinction from uh, Maple Leaf, as there was then no oppression section uh, in the OBCA. A third case which should be considered along with Maple Leaf Mills and West Steel is Burdon v. Zellers uh, Limited. Again, the coming together of uh, Hudson Bay and Zellers uh, and uh, a squeeze-out amalgamation, or I shouldn't say a squeeze-out, that's the essential difference, an amalgamation uh, uh, proposed. The difference was that the Canadian shareholders of Zellers were to have the choice to receive either the cash value of their shares or non-voting convertible preferred shares of Hudson's Bay. In other words, that shareholders were not being squeezed out, they were in effect uh, being squeezed in. They were allowed to, to remain shareholders in the combined entity. Notwithstanding that, the Quebec Superior Court uh, issued uh, an injunction. The amalgamation would eliminate all the applicant shares in Zellers, leaving the Hudson Bay as the only holder of Zellers' common shares. That was a distinction between the majority and the minority uh, sufficient to call for an injunction. There is a recent uh, a case which, which does approve, or uh, does not approve, but uh, in which uh, an interim junction was refused in an amalgamation squeeze out. That's a decision of the Alberta Queen's bench in Stevens v. Home Oil. Uh, a distinction uh, there, though, is that uh, the amalgamation after being completed called for, uh, the statute calls for approval by the court. Moreover, the amalgamation agreement uh, provided for approval uh, by the majority of the minority. There is uh, an earlier 1969 Manitoba case, Triad uh, Oil, which does approve a, an amalgamation uh, squeeze out. But again, in that case, the amalgamation uh, required court approval. And again, there was a majority of the minority. Uh, whether Triad would be good law today in light of uh, uh, the attitude that the courts are now taking to squeeze outs is difficult to say. Most importantly, the oppression remedy was not in the Manitoba statute. <clears throat> and is now and will be in the Ontario Act and the Canada Act. And uh, whenever one is uh, considering uh, the problem of arrangements or amalgamations, one now must have in mind the rights of the minority uh, in terms of uh, unfairly disregards the interests of language uh, in the oppression remedy. <clears throat> there are the arrangement cases which appear to allow for a squeeze out uh, uh, as a result of a share consolidation. However, uh, I am of the view that uh, the arrangement cases must now be seen in the light of Maple Leaf Mills and West Steel, and also seen uh, in the light of the oppression remedy, obviously, and uh, uh, in the light of Mr. Justice uh, Steele's, or, sorry, Mr. Justice Southey's judgment in Re Ripley. The result of the, of, uh, the arrangement in Re Ripley was, in effect, uh, uh, a straight cash out uh, of the minority. The arrangement under the OBCA, as it will under the new Act, requires court approval. The question that the court had to ask itself, whether there was fair value being paid to, uh, to the minority. Mr. Justice Southey held that the cash out price of $5 was fair if the company was going to continue as a public corporation. He could not, however, say whether $5 was, fair, was a fair price given the extent of the tax savings anticipated from the corporate change, and, quote, the resultant estimated increase in the value of the shares of the continuing shareholders. I suggest that this holding is particularly important and puts a considerable limitation on the ability to use a share consolidation to accomplish a squeeze-out. First, I suggest that it is extremely difficult to value minority shares as if they were going to participate in the advantages accruing to the reorganized company. It may well be tantamount to saying that the minority should be allowed to participate in the advantages accruing, uh, uh, sorry, it, it, it might be tantamount to saying that the minority should be allowed to participate in the reorganized company, and the only way that that might be possible is to allow them to remain as shareholders in the reorganized entity. I better uh, I'll move on. The discussion to this point has ignored the effect of Section 188 of the new Ontario Act. Section 188 is modeled on Policy 3-37 of the OSC, and Section 188 sets out the rules that now must be followed under the Ontario Act in a going private transaction. And a going, going private transaction is defined as an amalgamation, arrangement, consolidation 
carried out that would terminate a shareholder's interest without his consent and without the substitution of uh, security holding of equivalent value. Like policy 337, uh, section 188 uh, requires uh, independent valuation and uh, approval by majority of the minority of each class of affected securities. The natural question that arises is, does section 188 of the new Ontario Act change the jurisprudence in West Steel Roscoe and Maple Leaf Mills and uh, in Ree Ripley. Section 188 sub 5 expressly states that the rights provided by the section are in addition to any other rights that a holder of affected securities may have. I would argue that these rights include an application under the oppression remedies section, section 246. It is arguable, of course, that the legislature has in section 188 provided statutory sanction for a going private transaction, and that if its dictates are followed, a dissentient minority shareholder has no cause for complaint. But there is always subsection 5 to contend with. We shall simply have to wait and see. As noted above, the new Ontario Act in section 186 contains a compulsory acquisition section similar in terms to section 199 of the Canada Act, where 90% of the outstanding shares are acquired in a takeover bid or issuer bid. The new Ontario Act, however, includes a provision not found in the CBCA that gives the minority shareholder a correlative right to require the corporation to purchase his securities at fair value when 90% or more of that class of securities is held by the corporation. <coughs> Moreover, Every corporation that so holds 90% of the class is required to notify its security holders that they, that is the corporation, or that the shareholders, are entitled to require the corporation to purchase their securities. And the notice must indicate the price at which uh, the corporation is willing to pay. It should be noted that 187 is considerably broader than 186. The compulsory acquisition right is tr triggered when you get 90% through a takeover. The right under 187 is given to a security holder whenever the corporation has acquired, by or on behalf of a person, his affiliates, and his associates, 90%. The words are acquired by do not have particular reference to a takeover bid or an issuer bid. Moreover, the reason that the corporation must set out the price that it is willing to pay for the securities when it sends a security holder notice of his rights is that a price has not been set in the public market through either a takeover bid or an issuer bid. So that section uh, 186 is, is a significant uh, and interesting uh, new right. Another new feature of the Ontario Act is the right to dissent from fundamental changes and to demand appraisal and purchase of one's shares. The fundamental changes are set out in section 183, which is modeled on 184.1 of the CBCA. In terms of the discussion uh, uh, in this paper, the most noteworthy change is that uh, a, uh, a shareholder may dissent from an amalgamation. At least two questions are raised by the dissent and appraisal remedy. The first is on what principles uh, are, is fair value to be set, and, and are they such as to be a worthwhile remedy? Uh, the second question is whether if a right of dissent and appraisal is given for a, or a fundamental uh, change, that right is exclusive. In other words, if you're given a right to dissent uh, and uh, appraisal, does that mean you cannot bring an action under the oppression remedy? As to fair value, there are uh, three leading cases, Whitehorse Copper, uh, Montgomery against Shell Oil, and Reed Domglass. And interestingly, three different methods of valuation are used uh, in all of them. In Montgomery and Shell Oil, it was market value, in uh, Whitehorse, it was a combination of asset value, primarily in market value. In Domglass, it was capitalized earnings or investment value. By far the most important decision is the decision of Mr. Justice Greenberg in the Quebec Superior Court in Redomglass. The importance of Mr. Justice Greenberg's uh, uh, decision on fair value in Domglass is that he imports a subjective element into his calculation of fair value. That is, he, is, he explicitly states that he is setting fair value in the circumstances of the particular case. And the circumstances of the particular case uh, were an expropriation of uh, the minority shareholders' shares. Accordingly, there had to be a premium for forcible taking and no discount for minority uh, holdings. 
and the premium for forcible taking was some 20 percent. Uh, and uh, moreover, Mr. Justice Greenberg uh, did not, uh, uh, was not overly influenced by the uh, opinion of the experts. And uh, given the 20% uh, calculation for forcible taking, no discount for minority holdings, uh, Mr. Justice Greenberg came up with a value that was some 80% higher than uh, uh, the value of the majority of the experts. It will be interesting to see how far that subjective element in setting fair value and setting what Mr. Justice Greenberg referred to as a just and equitable price, which is uh, uh, an add-on to fair value, uh, will be followed uh, uh, by the courts in, uh, in other uh, uh, situations. As to the question of whether the appraisal remedy uh, is exclusive, uh, the courts and the commentators uh, are divided. And here the learning is mainly from uh, the United States. The better view, in my opinion, is that the appraisal remedy ought not to be considered exclusive and that it, sh and that it should be looked on upon as merely one option that is available uh, to an aggrieved shareholder. As the oppression remedy cases so vividly illustrate, a purchase of shares for value might not be an appropriate remedy in many situations. Moreover, it may be exactly the remedy that the shareholder does not want. He may well want to remain a participating member in the ongoing enterprise. The matter was succinctly stated in the leading American squeeze-out case, Singer v. Magnavox. It was argued there that the exclusive remedy for dissatisfaction with the merger and the squeeze-out was the appraisal remedy. Mr. Justice Duffy, for the court, said, in our view, the defendants cannot meet their fiduciary obligations to plaintiffs simply by relegating them to a statutory appraisal proceeding. And he further quoted a decision of the California Supreme Court, Jutkowitz v. Burns, Money may well satisfy some or most minority shareholders, but others may have different investment goals, tax problems, a belief in the ability of management to make them rich, or even a sentimental attachment to the stock, which leads them to have a different judgment as to the desirability of selling out. The Ontario Securities Commission has also expressed a tentative opinion that the appraisal remedy was not designed to cover the case of an amalgamation squeeze-out. The issue arose in uh, M. Loeb Limited. In refusing to allow M. Loeb to depart from the policy of the terms of policy 3-37, the Commission made the following comment with respect to the exclusivity of the appraisal remedy in an amalgamation squeeze-out. There is some force in the argument of counsel for Empire that the appraisal remedy was not intended to cover the situation of an amalgamation squeeze-out. Moreover, to say that it is, is to say that a share is at all times fungible with cash. That is clearly not so as a general proposition, and it's clearly not so in this particular case. The uh, uh, Canadian courts have still to uh, decide the matter, but uh, as I've said in my view, the appraisal remedy ought not to be considered uh, uh, exclusive, and that uh, an action under the oppression remedy or the shareholder's derivative action uh, uh, still ought to be held available, and uh, I would guess that that will be the judicial uh, uh, result. Uh, a word on uh, uh, winding up. You're winding up. I see my time is uh, 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 running. But uh, winding up has always, on, on the just and equitable ground, has always been a potent shareholder remedy, or, or probably more accurately, the threat of a winding up has been a very potent shareholder remedy. That remedy, though, has been greatly broadened uh, by the decision of uh, Lord Wilberforce in 1972 in Ebrahimi against Westbourne Galleries. Ebrahimi was the classic incorporated partnership case where, as a result of a disagreement, uh, uh, one of the directors was ousted from office. Uh, uh, profits were uh, distributed uh, uh, totally through director's remuneration so that uh, there was the classic freeze-out uh, of uh, the minority shareholder. In his judgment, uh, Lord Wilberforce analyzed the rationale for and greatly broadened the just and equitable remedy. The most important quote uh, 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 in Lord Wilberforce's judgment when uh, he was considering the exercise of legal rights by shareholders, that is, the right to elect the board, he made the following comment. The just and equitable, equitable provision does, as equity always does, enable the court to subject the exercise of legal rights to equitable considerations 
considerations, that is, of a personal character arising between one individual and another, which may make it unjust or inequitable to insist on legal rights or to exercise them in a particular way. In my view, that is one of the most important statements on company law that has been made by a final court of appeal in many years. It's true that it was a private company case, and it's true that it's a winding up case. But I would argue that the entire sense of the oppression remedy is neatly summarized in Lord Wilberforce's statement. <clears throat> in the Ontario courts, in a number of cases, Dunham against Apollo Tours, uh, Rogers against Asian Court Holdings, LTD, have expressly adopted and applied uh, Lord Wilberforce's judgment uh, in Ebrahimi. A word about the derivative action. Uh, 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 for a change, Ontario was a pioneer in this area. Section 99, now Section 97 of the OBCA, has had the shareholders' derivative action uh, uh, since 1970. Most importantly, uh, the courts have shown a real willingness to grant shareholders leave to bring the action and have uh, uh, not uh, uh, tied the shareholder up in procedural knots at the leave stage. And the two important judgments uh, there are uh, Mark J. Uh, uh, Holdings LTD against uh, Levy and Armstrong uh, v. Gardner, a, recent, a more recent uh, uh, case. There are a few important changes in the new Ontario Act and the derivative action section. Uh, there is a section that now expressly allows an ex parte interim injunction, which seemed to be an oversight noted by Mr. Justice Reed in Gold Harvey, Quebec Manitou Mines under uh, the original section uh, 99. One section that is left out of the new Ontario Act, but that is included in the CBCA, is the ratification uh, a section. The question of, uh, of what breaches of duties by directors may be ratified is one of the most vexed questions in company law. For instance, if the directors have issued additional shares to a third party to fend off a takeover bid, may that action, if it is in fact an issuance for an improper purpose, be sanctioned by shareholder approval? If it may, might the minority shareholders have a complaint if sanction is obtained through the votes of the majority shareholders and directors? Are the holders of the newly issued shares entitled to vote to approve the issuance? The solution in section 235.1 of the CBCA is neat and effective. It simply says that uh, no action may be stayed as a result of ratification. Ratification is simply to be treated as a piece of evidence by the court in considering the complaint. The Ontar new Ontario Act is silent on that point and it is such an important oversight uh, that I would hope that uh, it will be remedied before the act becomes law. One point to which uh, I would like to refer uh, uh, briefly, and I'll just take another uh, five minutes or so, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one critical matter, uh, I'm the co-chairman, so I don't see why I shouldn't take that. <laughs> <clears throat> One critical matter with respect to the shareholders' derivative action is the question of costs, which seems to me to put a considerable limitation on, on that shareholder remedy and indeed uh, possibly on any shareholder uh, remedy. Anglo-Canadian jurisprudence, as you know, and unlike its American counterpart, normally answers the cost questions by saying that the costs fall on the losing party. And if the action fails in a shareholder's derivative suit, that would be the shareholders who brought the suit. Any shareholder contemplating such an action must be advised of the very significant financial risk they run in what almost by definition is lengthy and costly litigation. There is, in my opinion, a solution at hand. Through the use or judicial use of Section 245 sub D of the new Ontario Act and Section 233 sub D of the CBCA, those sections say that the court may at any time make an order requiring the corporation to pay reasonable legal fees incurred by the complainant in connection with the action. Now, I think that section ought to be used uh, by the courts in the way it was used by the English Court of Appeal in Waller Steiner v. Moore, which was a shareholder's derivative action and in which the question of costs came up. <clears throat> and I'll just take a moment to read what Lord Denning says uh, in summarizing the matter because it's extremely important. If the action succeeds, the whole benefit will go to the company. As a result, it's only just that the minority shareholder should be indemnified against the cost he incurs on its behalf. 
If the action succeeds, the wrongdoing director will be ordered to pay the costs. But if they are not recovered from him, they should be paid by the company. But what if the action fails? Assuming that the minority shareholder had reasonable grounds for bringing the action, he should not himself be liable to pay the costs of the other side. But the company itself should be liable because he was acting for it and not for himself. <clears throat> In addition, he should himself be indemnified by the company in respect of his own costs, even if the action fails. It is a well-known maxim of the law that he who would take the benefit of a venture if it succeeds ought also to bear the burden if it fails. <clears throat> that is the position as to costs in the derivative action that now pertains in England. And I suggest the matter is even clearer here than it was in England. The condition which the English Court of Appeal thought so important that the minority shareholder had reasonable grounds for bringing the action is the statutory precondition for bringing the action under the OBCA, the New Ontario Act, and the CBCA. That is, a shareholder must get leave of the court on the basis that he is acting in good faith and that it is prima facie in the interests of the corporation that the action be allowed to proceed. Once there's that finding, the position as to cost should be exactly as stated by Lord Denny. <clears throat> In my view, it only awaits for uh, uh, imaginative counsel to make that argument to the courts and for a remedial ruling by the courts on the subject for the shareholders' derivative action to be made truly meaningful uh, in Ontario. Uh, I regret that uh, time doesn't allow me to deal with the Ontario Securities Commission because the role of the Commission and the role of the Toronto Stock Exchange in protecting uh, uh, minority shareholders' rights has become uh, increasingly important over the last decade and will in the future. One cannot be uh, uh, fully aware of the rights that are accorded minority shareholders in this province without being uh, cognizant of the Commission's policy statements and uh, uh, its uh, uh, jurisprudential uh, pronouncements in the cases and uh, uh, what it indicates, uh, the areas uh, it indicates in which it's going to move. One thing I would point out to you that I think ought to be noted and may alarm some of you. In the, shareholders in the shareholders' oppression remedy section, section 246 of the Ontario Act, the Commission is given independent standing, apart from uh, a, uh, a complainant. So that uh, under the new Ontario Act, the Commission, if it is so minded, may act as a roving ombudsman, if you like, on behalf of minority shareholders. It's in no, it, it, and that is, of course, only in the case of an offering corporation. But it is a very great uh, uh, broadening, if you like, of the Commission's uh, jurisdiction. And it will be interesting to see how the Commission uses it uh, in the years to come. Well, I'm sorry I've taken so long. Thank you very much.